Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I have Dr. Jeffrey Gross back on. He's a spine fellowship trained neurological surgeon and founder of ReCelebrate, a regenerative medicine clinic in Henderson, Nevada. And today we're going to be talking about the MRI that I had on my spine and some of our findings. Why do we want to do that? Why am I sharing that? Because Dr. Gross has some amazing ways that he is rejuvenating folks' spines. So if you've been told you have degenerative Degenerative disc disease or degenerative changes, there may be ways to regenerate your spine and help you get rid of some pain, but also just feel like a million bucks. So, Dr. Gross and I in this podcast are going to go through my MRI. We try our best to be able to make this a podcast that is visual as much as it is audio. But if you're really wanting to see the best version of this podcast, head over to my YouTube. It's Doc J. Krause TV. And you'll have a great view of what's going on if you want to see those images. So let's get on with the podcast. Hey, Health Junkies. So I brought Dr. Jeffrey Gross back on to talk about my MRI because we did an MRI on me because I was telling him a little bit about my back pain that was going down to my foot and it was causing a ton of issues for me. And I like lifting heavy weights. And I was like, man, I really need to know, am I doing myself, you know, a disservice here or what? So Dr. Gross, welcome to the Health Fix podcast once again. Thank you. I'm excited to talk about my back. And and so we have the the imaging here. Folks, of course, we did a little bit of a trial run before this in a, in a parking lot outside of a I'm telling you guys, it was a Wendy's um, in Milwaukee because I didn't have anywhere else to stop. So there you have it. Did I go get a Frosty? I wish. No, I, I after my back, after we learned about the back, I was like, I, I'm just going to go home now. So <laughs> that's the preview to it. So Dr. Gross, kind of break it down in terms of the things you were asking me about my pain so that you kind of can give folks a sense of why you would do an MRI, why we thought it was a good idea to run straight to that. Because a lot of docs, um, you know, unfortunately, insurance wise, we have to jump through hoops normally. But if we decide to to do cash pay MRIs, we could do whatever we want. So give us the scoop as to why we would want to do an MRI in my case. Well, an MRI is a wonderful imaging tool ahead of its time. Um, that helps us see a lot of things that we cannot see on x-rays and CAT scans. And although there are needs at times for x-rays and CAT scans and maybe even some other tests, MRI is probably your best yield for looking at common ailments, problems, symptoms stemming from the spine. Mm -hmm. So when you told me about your symptoms, which uh, we'll get into here in a moment, an MRI was the most... um, useful thing I could think of to help us correlate or figure out why you have those symptoms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. And and in, in particular, you had me seek out a specific medical imaging place that had a specific type of MRI because you've looked at some of my other patients' MRIs and you're like, oh, these MRIs aren't as detailed. Give us mm-hmm. give us that keyword that folks want to be looking for and asking their docs for for a really good quality MRI. Yeah, let, let me, can I explain a little bit about MRIs? Because, Please. Because most patients don't know and most doctors don't even know when they're ordering them. And when they get the results back, it's just a written report. Very few people look at the pictures unless you're a spine specialist like me or or the radiologist. And um, people don't know the difference. Most docs don't. So first of all, like anything you do, the better quality the image, the more you might find when you're looking to find something. Mm -hmm. So and MRIs have grown up uh, since they've been around in the 1980s and They've grown up in improvement in quality, and that comes from something called signal to noise ratio. We want more signal and less noise. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's like a radio, staticky radio signal. For those of us that remember listening to the actual radio, um, you know, you want less static and more high fidelity sound coming through. And then a number of years ago, they came up with high definition radio. Remember that? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. what's the difference between regular and high definition? More signal, less noise. So. The latest, greatest MRI that you can get routinely in the community, in most communities, 
is called a three Tesla uh, MRI. Three Tesla Tesla stands for the magnetic strength, named for uh, you know Professor Tesla, uh, mm -hmm. who you know was one of the leading authorities on magnetic electromagnetism years ago. So um, now. The commonly in the community, you'll find 1.5 Tesla. And if you are at an orthopedic doctor's office and they say, oh, we have an MRI here in the office, it's usually 0.3 or 0.5. But wait, there's more. <laughs> it's not just the linear relation of those numbers, meaning if you go for a one Tesla and I want you to have a three Tesla, the three Tesla is not three times better. Because the magnetic strength field in the signal equation, the signal to noise calculation, is by its square. So if a three Tesla magnet is three squared compared to a one Tesla, which is one squared. So that's a nine times difference. Mm -hmm. So there are other factors besides the magnetic strength, by the way. There are software gradients and sequences I want to get into in a second. But now everyone will have a, a PhD after watching your podcast. <laughs> the um the, you know, they charge the same generally to the insurance company because the CPT code is the same. So why get the crappy one when you can get a good one? And the better the picture, the more the doctor can do with it. Just like if you went to buy a new television and you went to Costco and you said, oh, I can get this, this 4K Ultra HD <laughs> plasma screen here. It's the costs have come way down compared to an old staticky tube TV, right? So that's what we're looking at. Um, generally speaking, there are other factors that go into signal to noise. Now, when you get an MRI, you get a, a number of sequences and they, they're different techniques. And that's why you're in, you're in that machine for anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes because they're doing multiple sequences. A sequence is a, a bunch of slices. Mm -hmm. And those sequences look at different things um, commonly you get T1 and T2, which stand for time one and time two, and that determines when they pick up the signal and what type of fluids and, and chemicals they're looking at. Because yes, we're looking at biochemicals. We're looking at water and protons. Um, but there's, there's a fancy one that I look at and I have to order it especially because most places are cheap and dirty and don't want to include it. And it's called inversion recovery when we're looking at the spine. It's actually STIR, I think it's short T inversion recovery. And um, we call it STIR or IR. And those images help me look at the bone marrow. And because I do regenerative medicine, the bone marrow is, is often my target. Uh, so I'm looking at very specific changes in the bone marrow. Um, so that was probably way too much, but uh, hope someone yeah. liked it. <laughs> it's it's great because like no, it's for us, it's imaginary, right? You're like, okay, MRI, they're going to stick me in a tube. It's going to suck. That's kind of what most people equate to MRI. But I don't think a lot of folks really understand what's happening in that and that we're actually looking, you know, what we're looking for and how. Right. So, you know, we're, we're lucky to have MRIs, uh, you know, because I, when I was a uh, when I was training, you know, um, there was only one MRI. I was in the hospital, you know. Not everyone got an MRI because there wasn't enough to go around. So, I still trained in an era where we had to listen to patients and examine them. And I want to be clear that we don't treat the MRIs; we treat the patient. And and if and if for any reason you you see a physician and the physician doesn't examine you and spends a minute with you and just pops up the MRI and looks at it or tells you what's on it, and that's what they're addressing, run away. Because the MRI may not, we see things on the MRI that may not be the cause of the pain at all. Right. Yeah. Right. So anyway. No, that's that's huge to talk about. And and one of the things that, you know, in, in my head, I always, before I run an MRI and folks, I, I always will warn them that like, we may see something, it may correlate, it may not. We may find really random things, like one of the things we found in my mid-back that- Right. Who knows? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's see what you got on me and, and whatever questions you want, you were going to ask me, because I know that for for you, there's a certain sequence when you look at MRIs, you ask folks certain things. And guys, right. he asked me a million questions more than anyone's ever asked me about my back. So and my pain and legs. So we'll have you just run through it just like. All right. 
It's we'll done. pretend. We'll pretend we never did it before. Yeah, exactly. Right. So do you do you remember in the in the nineties there's a show called Nip Tuck? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so the two sur- two plastic surgeons would sit down and a new patient would come in and be like the start of the show and and they would say, "Tell us what you don't like about yourself." And I thought it was brilliant <laughs> because. Um, so, uh, patient, you know, I've seen thousands and thousands of patients as you have, and you know, some come in and tell you exactly what's wrong. Some come in and say, "I'm here, figure me out," you know, and it and and there's a lot in between. So I like to start out with, "Tell me what your problem is, what your symptoms are," yeah. and sometimes I have to help people describe them. There, some people are just not good descriptors of their symptoms. Oh, I have soreness. Well, is that pain? Some people don't like to use the word pain, for example. Others will say, "Oh." I'm dying. And well, what's causing you to die? You know, what's, you know, give me more. So I would say to you, tell me exactly what you have, where you have it. And I'll ask you questions to, to, you know, bring out some flowery information about it. So, so, okay. So we'll, we'll we'll role play here. I'll be the doctor. You be the patient uh, in this, in this podcast, where is your pain? My pain's in my low back and my right SI joint. And mm. more than anything, it's in the right SI joint. Okay. So you, you already gave me more than most people because you know anatomy and you know some stuff. So most people would come and say, I have low back pain. And I would look at them and say, great. Can you please stand up, turn around and point to where in your low back? Because the low back is this big, mm-hmm. right? It, it's, a, you know, it's like two feet across and it could be depending on what you call the low back. And some people are afraid to say buttock and it might include their butt and whatever and and um, or, or or something else. So, so you said low back. So I would start with: Does the low back component, because I'm breaking it down, does that come from the the midline where the spine might be? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay. And then I'd ask you to point to where that is, or tell me: Is it at your belt line? If we're telemedicine, I you know instead of showing me, I might say: Is it? Tell me. Tell me by by relation to your belt line or your waist. Mm-hmm. It's below my belly button and like literally a little bit below. If I put my hands on my hips and I yeah. brought my fingers around, it's a little below yeah. there. So that that tells me it's probably in the L4, L5 region, maybe lower. Um, the waistline um, is commonly known to be associated with crossing through the disc between the fourth and fifth lumbar bones. So we count those one through five. Um, starting below the last rib, going down to the tailbone. All one is lumbar one, two, three, four, five. The discs are numbered in between, um, which is a very funny thing because you you hear of it, the L3-4 disc. It's the it's L3-4. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, you live on Maple Street, you live at 8 Maple Street, someone else lives at 10 Maple Street, Street but the yard in between is 8 to 10 Maple Street. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're talking about here. So the waist is probably around the L4-5 disc area. So that gives me some idea already where to look, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay, so we know you have low back pain. I might ask you more questions like what sets it off? What makes it feel better? Like, you know, positioning, bending. And then and then you said it goes into the SI joint. Which SI joint did you say? The right one. Okay, does it ever go to the left side? Nope, okay. always to the right. Does it travel from the lower back spinal area to the SI joint or is the SI joint separate? No, it travels. Okay. And for the listeners uh, that that don't know, the SI joint is, some people don't come in and say my SI joint, but but it's a spot above the right butt cheek uh, in the lower back that's probably three or so inches to the each, either side, but in your case, hurts on the right side. Mm-hmm. And then I would ask questions about that. So does that, is that pain any different than the spinal pain? Yes. Sometimes I, I will, I will barely feel the spinal pain, but I feel the throbbing at the right SI joint happening all the time. Okay. Does that, does that, we'll call it the SI joint pain because we've named it that. Does, and that stands for sacroiliac joint. It's where the pelvis meets the sacrum of the spine. Uh, does that pain, um, radiate or move anywhere? Does it go down? Does it go up? Does it go sideways? It'll go all the way down to my foot and the bottom of my foot. Okay. So a lot of people say the all the way down phrase, and I Mm -hmm. stop them and say, show me the Google maps. How does it travel all the way down? Um, (laughs) does it go down the front of the thigh, the back of the thigh? Cause now I'm thinking nerves and I want to know what nerves might be involved. 
all the way on the right. So right lateral. So on the side of my thigh, on the side of my low leg, and then it seems to go like behind my ankle wraps around boom to bottom of the foot. Does it involve any toes? Yes. Yes, it does. Rich. In particular, my third toe is a problem. And so is my second sometimes. Okay. So, so that helps us the, the further down it goes in the, in the leg and foot. And the, the more we know about the toes, the better we can discern or guess which nerves are involved. So that gives us some ideas. Um, okay. So that tells me L5 and or S1 nerves, and then we can track those nerves potentially back up to the spine, but those nerves also pass by the sacroiliac joint and can be irritated there as well. So we have this complexity, right? We have like uh, two crimps in the wire and we have to figure out which one is causing it or both, right? Because that's an option. Yep. Okay, so any weakness? Yes, I will sometimes have the foot doesn't want to come along with me. It, I don't have foot drop. And so folks, foot drops, like I can't actually move my foot. My foot will move. It just doesn't want to. Sometimes I kind of tend towards dragging my leg behind me. So a limp. I have a good gangster limp is what okay, happens. Okay, awesome. But not on purpose. Not on and, purpose. No. And, and the, the weakness you have is in lifting the foot, even though you don't have a full on full foot drop. Right. Yeah. Right. Some patients, some patients will say their doctor said that in foot drop because they have just a little bit of weakness. So, but truly you're right. Foot drops and you can't lift that foot at all. So you have weakness in what we call the, the dorsiflexion or the lifting function of the foot. And that's commonly related to the L5 nerve also. So there, there are motor or movement functions. That's the movement function. There are, then there are pain and sensory functions. Do you have any numbness? Yes. Sometimes that fourth toe will, will get numb. So third and fourth between the two, they kind of battle back and forth. Okay. So we have a lot of indicators for L5 nerve, maybe spreading into the S1 nerve. Uh, but so I have a good idea where things are are coming and going. And I could ask a lot more questions than I might, but for the purposes of this podcast, we have a sense of your pain and your nerve involvement. Some people don't have nerve involvement. Some people have nerve involvement without pain. So um, if if it were so perfect, chat GPT could do this, but uh, <laughs> it, it, and it probably will get better at it. But um, okay. So this is where I would examine you. And now, because we do a lot of telehealth these days, that's difficult. So I have to ask more questions to compensate <laughs> for the lack of an exam, right? Mm -hmm. And if I were to examine, if you were here in the office or I were at Wendy's with you getting a Frosty, um, but just the little, the little kid size, I think that's okay. You, you can, uh, <laughs> you can, um, uh, you know, I would test the, the strength. I'd have you push down, push up. We would test all the muscles of your leg. We do both legs for comparison. I would test sensation to sharp touch, light touch. Maybe uh, we also can do vibration and position sense if we want to get fancy. Which we do sometimes if we're looking for something else. Uh, there are some provocative tests of the SI joint. Provocative in this case uh, means we want to stress it to see if we can bring back the pain for a second. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. And then uh, I would have you do range of motion with your back. I would palpate, meaning lay my hands on your back and gently touch different things and see if I could poke and poke and prod and 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 see if you have some tender spots. Um, and there are some there's some art to that as well. Uh, and if your doctor hasn't examined you that way, um, then uh, they're only treating the MRI. And I've seen a myriad of patients that have come to me having had surgery somewhere where the doctor only looked at the MRI, treated something they saw in the MRI, but it wasn't the problem, the patient's still suffering. So that is a popular thing in this day's quick cookbook, insurance-driven, crappy medicine world. There, I said it. It's okay, that's why you're here. <laughs> that's why we're talking about it. <laughs> I hope so. I'm here to support the right way. Okay, so then we look at the MRI. You ready? Let's do it, let's do it. All I right. think everyone's like, let's see, how bad was it? Okay, so I'm sharing screen. Let me know when it pops up on your side. We've got it. All right. Now, of course, you know, we didn't say this at the outset, but uh, you gave me permission to share all your private uh, yes. information. You're publicly sharing this for the benefit of all. Yes. And um, so I already brought up the MRI here, and I have on the left screen a side view of the lower back. 
and on the right screen, a cross-section view of the lower back. Um, and I, this is a common way for me to look at it. Um, very quickly for orientation, I can check, I can see it has your name, has your birthday. So everyone can send you a birthday card. Yes. And then, and then, um, this was done. You can see that it says three T up here in the right upper hand corner. And at the top, I have my different sequences. So this is a localizer. This is, um, an FR, uh, T2 basically has some other techniques with it. T1 side view. Uh, fast spin echo. Here's my stir I was talking about. And then I have two angled. They didn't give me an angled stir and that's okay. I can live without it, but, um, um, you know, different places will do different things. As long as I get these different sequences, I'm happy. So we have some side views and cross section views. So the side view is if I were standing to your left, Janine, I would be looking through your body, through the side of you. And this is what I would see from your last rib down to your butt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just from there to there. That's all that is. We can't look above. We can't look below. They didn't do that. They focused in on this. This line here is the skin on your back and your butt. And this dark area are your guts, but they, they darken them out to, to improve the contrast and visualization of the tissues in your lower back. Nice. So you can see the bones of your lower back now, these squared or rectangle things. I'm going to lighten the image up a little bit um, just because I don't know how it transfers to your side. But that looks there, that's, better. That's pretty stark. OK, so you can see the gray in the bones. These are the vertebra or vert vertebral vertebrae. And then in between the bones are the cartilage discs. OK, and and this is the last top of the last bone called the sacrum. Mm -hmm. And the sacrum is part of the pelvis and part of the spine. And the side of the sacrum is where you form the sacroiliac joint. Now, we're really not gonna see that much here on these images, uh, but you can see the top of the sacrum. This little thing that looks like a mini disc isn't a functional disc. It's, it's, it's a leftover uh, vestigial disc that you know, when animals have tails, they have more segments, but we we don't. We they're all fused together to be the sacrum. It looks like they're separate, but they're not. Um, and this curve in your lower back is actually a good curve. That's called the lordotic curve of the lower back. It's part of what makes up a normal anatomy. And if you don't have this, uh, there are many reasons for it, but uh, it could become a problem. So a lot of chiropractors will say, "Hey, we got to get your curve back," and in part, they're correct, uh, but that's only part of the story. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, these are some of the bones that stick out in your lower back. If if you bend forward and you see those bones stick out in the midline, these are those little bones because when you look at the bones of the spine, they form a ring, and that ring is designed to protect this canal or form this canal where the white and the gray strands are. Mm -hmm. And that that is your spinal canal and all the way from your brain down to about the L12 junction is this gray spinal cord. But the vast majority of your lower back or lumbar spine has no spinal cord in it. People don't understand that. So I want to make it clear the spinal cord uh, ends at about the L1-2 junction going down, counting down from L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Okay. Below there, though, you have nerve branches. And although it looks like one big nerve here, these are branches here. You can see them start to uh, split up here, okay? So those, those branches are of the nerve roots that leave the spine and go down. And some of them form the sciatic nerve down the back of the thigh and then branch out into the different places down your leg and into the toes that we talked about earlier. <laughs> and as a group, they look like a horse's tail. So they're called the cauda equina. Okay. So over here, we have a cross section. And what we're doing is we're looking up the body. So if you were lying down in bed and we were standing at the foot of your bed, you're looking at the ceiling. Um, we're looking at you. So you're, you're backwards. So this is your right side. This is your left side. And because we're looking up your body, this is one of the bones sticking out on the back. These are your muscles on either side of the spine. Um, and it, you know, it looks like 
you know, uh, you're buying a, a rib roast here at the grocery store, right? These looks like meat, marble, has got marbling in it. And this is the skin behind there. Sorry to refer to you like that, but that's how it is. No, it's and good. It's good for people to know that that's what they're looking at. I, I think it's great. I I also, you know, you had mentioned to me that you see more marbling a lot of times in folks that don't have muscles, um, strong as strong of muscles in the back. True. And that's something so, too. So this is a very lean piece of meat. <laughs> uh, sometimes we see a lot of fat in there. Um, and people who don't exercise or don't, don't maintain these muscles. And th there's a lot of research that shows that the uh, a volume of this muscle and its meaty volume uh, is a good harbinger for, for your back, meaning you'll have less pain, less fewer problems <clears throat> and mm -hmm. vice versa. Okay. So the strength of your back uh, is is important. And these are the main muscles of your back. They're, they're, they're on either side of your back, either side of your spine. They go up and down like pillars. Mm -hmm. This particular cross-section shows the vertebral bone and shows these little dots. These dots are your cauda equina, your nerve roots going down the canal of your spine. See how it's protected in there? Yes. Now, here's a cool thing. See these yellow dotted lines on the left? <clears throat> when I scroll the right side, that middle dotted line moves because it's taking slices and I can look slice by slice by slice. Okay. So now it's clear to me that something goes going on with this disc. There's a white spot and it is, I'm going to use this word, then remove it, bulging out into the nerve sac. Do you see that? Mm-hmm. But it's it's the the definition of bulge is a is a relaxing of the of the disc more than fifty percent of its circumference usually affiliated with age. This is not a bulge. It is actually a amount of slipped disc that we call a herniation, and it's contained by the ligament. So it's a protrusion form of herniation, mm -hmm. and the white spot is typically an inf inflammation spot related to a tear because to have a herniation there must be a tear in the ring of the disc. So if we if we slice right through there, this spot right here is that tear. And you can see the, I'm going to use this word again, bulging nature of the herniation. Mm -hmm. And you can see the nerves are a little bit uh, kind of crowded when you compare it to a spot above. They have plenty of room. Mm -hmm. So this causes a little area here of narrowing of the nerve pathways. And that's we call that stenosis, but this stenosis is due to this herniated disc. So that's between the L4 and the L5 bone, and that, that could correlate with your symptoms. But wait, if I'm thorough and I look at the last disc, there is something over here, but not over here. Now remember, this is your right, this is your left. Okay. So, uh, you you told me that your symptoms go down your right leg and affect the L5 nerve. And lo and behold, the L5 nerve does pass by here. Mm -hmm. And it's its space is taken away from it. So guess what? I have a yellow line here. I can I can do a slicing through that. And now on the side view, we take the side view out to the corner. And now, which looked normal in the middle, that L5 S1 bottom disc is now showing itself. There's a big honking piece of material sitting out in what we call the foramen where the nerve travels out. Mm -hmm. A little bit here, but here it's kind of open. You can actually see up at L3-4, this, this little gray thing, that's the nerve coming out your spine to join the sciatic nerve. Here it's harder to see, and here it's completely obliterated. So I think the vast majority of your symptoms, down your leg at least, and possibly through your SI joint, are coming through because of this L5-S1 foraminal herniation of the disc. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely very clear there. Very clear. It's crystal clear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go to the stir. I'm going to go over the stir. This is that special sequence. And I'm looking at the bone marrow here. Now you can see that herniated disc a little better. 
right there. There's the one at L45, but the one at L5S1 is, is a doozy, okay? Here's the left side at L5S1. It, you can see it's open, 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 but it's it's not open on the right side. It's got that piece in there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But these are open. This one, this one is a little bit of an issue. You can also have L5 nerve root involvement from the passing L5 nerve root going by here and then exiting here. And that that is kind of a, a double inflammatory issue on the nerve or double compression. Mm -hmm. And so it'll, a lot of times folks are going to be seeing this and going like, all right, so you mentioned <laughs> the bone marrow and is my bone marrow good with the stir? Do I have enough in there? Do I need some boosting of my bone marrow? Yeah, so your stir is is quite good. We're looking for, you know, we're looking for changes in the bone marrow that show that it's not as uh, robustly active and instead it might be degenerated. And we see that surrounding disc degeneration and you don't have significant loss of disc height you do have a little bit up here. See how this is irregular at at the at the junction where your thoracic spine, where the rib cage is, meets your lumbar spine. You have some irregularities and some here, uh, which, but the marrow doesn't look horrible. Just right here, there's this little kind of divot. Mm -hmm. We call that a Schmorl's node, if you must know. Oh, uh, I remember that from school. <laughs> You got your little schmorl's node. And then you do have some, see the disc material here is degenerating out in different spots. So these are degenerated. And I don't recall, you said you you really don't have, you had some pain at that junction, did you not? And we had to discover this backwards. I had to ask you about it or? Yeah, because the, the only time it shows up is when someone does a massage on <laughs> that side and like they just get to that right point. It's like, I, I'm like, mm. I get like a little squirrely on the table. That's the one spot. Um, since having the review last time, one of my one of my friends had said, "Well, you have larger breasts," and she's like, "Do you think you're getting pulled forward?" And some of it's related to that. And I'm like, "Oh, huh, I didn't think about that." But it, I don't know. it can be a factor. I mean, you know, it, it can be a factor, right? You you it postural chronic postural issues you know, related to um, your body or whatever, of course, you can degenerate things here. And, and it's a junction, a junction of one part of the spine with another where the anatomy changes is like a fulcrum. So it takes additional stress. Okay. Okay. Physical stress. Like, you know, if you remember physics, like it, it's a, it's a weak point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see because obviously, you know, we're rotating at thoracic still where lumbar doesn't quite move as much. In that case. Right. So so that's why it's a junction, because it's a relatively fixed part of the spine meshing with a relatively mobile part of the spine. Things to think about, things to think about. Now, is there anywhere in with my Schmorl's node and things there, is there anything with exosomes, with PRP, with anything we could do there to, to support that disc or even make those Dis, not the disc, the vertebrae, but, and then make those discs happy. I know I'm going to get that question. Well, yeah, there, there are. I mean, in your case, I wouldn't, if you only have symptoms during massage and this is all I see, I probably wouldn't, it's not worth it at this okay. point. Um, okay. But your spine is actually really good compared to most. We see all kinds of degeneration. I see a lot of degenerated disc complexes, which is the disc has lost some height. Uh, it's lost some of its color. Let me show you that T2. Um, so your discs are a little dark here mm -hmm. compared to, let's say, this disc. It has some brighter lines in it. Mm -hmm. So where's my gray white? Here it is. There. So you see how this is kind of a lighter gray here and here and yeah. here. And then down here, it's a little darker. That darker is some loss of water content or dehydration or what the radiologists call desiccation, which is just a fancy term for dryness. So the, when it starts to lose water, your cartilage gets drier. Drier cartilage is more likely to crack, break, and tear, mm -hmm. just, like, just like an engine gasket, 
right? You replace your gaskets with a nice flexible rubber one after the old one has been, has had all the temperature changes and cracked and crumbly. It's just, it's just a gasket. So, so in, in patients like that, we start to see marrow changes adjacent to the disc on either side. And those were described by Dr. Modic, M-O-D-I-C, out of the Cleveland Clinic. And they're often referred to as modic changes. Huh. Okay. Okay. So you see that word on your MRI report. Now, some radiologists are lazy. And instead of describing all that stuff, they'll just write degenerative disc changes. I see that often. I see is, that often. Which is lazy, lazy, and lazy. That doesn't help us. Of course, we now we have to go back and look at the pictures, which is fun. I look at them anyway, but um, the reports don't help anybody these days. They're just not very good. There are some guys. I want. I don't want to hurt everyone there, but I, I mean, <laughs> they should. The radiologists should be saying exactly what they see anatomically. They shouldn't be um, classifying them all under a garbage term. And then, yeah. and to boot, they call it a disease, degenerative disc disease. It's not really a disease. Come on. If it's a disease, then we're all doomed. <laughs> it's it's, it's age-related degenerative changes or can be related to old trauma also. I'm glad you're clarifying that because I, I do get that question too from a lot of patients. Like, oh my gosh, I have a disease in my spine. And it's like, no, no, it's not that. It's just age. But with age, you know, a lot of folks are thinking like, okay, doc, is there something if I do have these modic changes, if I do have Schmorl's nose, what, and, and I am having a lot of pain, what would you do? What would you do in that case? What would you? Well, there, there, you know, I'm trying not to do surgery unless someone has to have surgery. Right. Sure. So, so, um, so things short of surgery. Well, first we start out with the very basics, you know, uh, physical therapy, weight loss, if it's if it's something that would would help and, and there's too much weight. Uh, strengthening of the of these muscles, mm -hmm. these paraspinal muscles. Now yours are fantastic. I could use yours as an example, right? These the, you have great muscles. So you're you're doing the right stuff here. I paid um, him to say that guys. No, no <laughs> <I'm> kidding. <laughs> but but you do have great muscles. So so you know I mean there are things we would do there. Now, we also sometimes offer palliative injections called uh, through pain management. And that because sometimes it's enough just to get someone to feel better, help their nerve sometimes down their leg and get them walking and exercising again. It's not going to cure anything, but it can be a reasonable way to approach something. Plus, if it's if the if the situation is complex and I want to know if you've got multiple issues in your spine and I want to know exactly where the pain might be coming from when it's not clear, when I correlate your symptoms with the MRI, I can do a test block. We can inject one area with a little Novocaine type substance and sometimes a little steroid. Um, and if you felt better in a specific area or specific nerve distribution down your leg, then I say, aha, that spot is involved. It's like going to the fuse box and flipping one switch and then yelling inside, hey, which room do the lights go off in? You know? <laughs> Oh, well, we've oh. done that a couple of times in our house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that there's an approach. And then, and then usually after though, if those things didn't do enough, that's when you're talking surgery, but now we have regenerative medicine options to fill that gap between regular pain management therapy all the way through surgery. So now we have a new tool in there that's before surgery. That's huge. That's huge. Because I think a lot of people aren't like, oh, I really want surgery, but definitely looking for solutions or or even just like, I think for most people, it's like, if you can make the pain stop, I don't really care how you do it. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> That's how I get it in my office sometimes. No, it's amazing. People will come in and say, my leg is so bad, please just cut it off. And and they're they're being a little bit facetious, but it's it's it speaks to how bad it is. Yeah. And that's, that's the part that, you know, kills me. And, and, you know, in my case, of course, I did want to get the MRI because it was starting to really impede my ability to hike, my ability to work, <laughs> you know? So, you know, there are things where it's like, okay, if you have the, the knowledge and you know what's going on, then there's lots, lots of things you can do. So, right. all right, keep going. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, we're doing, we're doing, you, you drive, you tell me where you want to go from here. 
Well, I think at this point, since we've kind of talked about, you know, my my flap going on that's that's compressing things, I think the next thing for for folks in general would be, all right, so obviously I don't have something that would benefit from, say, an injectable of an exosome or or stem cell. What kind of case in which someone like what what would be cases in which you would and how would it look if you can even give us a demo on the screen like what would how would yeah. you inject in or like what would you do just because i think a lot of folks are like okay prp is cool exosomes i don't know what they are and what you know give it give us a demo of what you do all right so let's say you came in and this is all we saw mm -hmm. uh your l5s1 was beautiful your l45 has this herniated disc with a tear and we saw bone marrow changes here above that disc and below that disc. And the disc was a little flatter mm -hmm. and it was more degenerated looking and you had pain and the pain was only centered on the spinal area and maybe going down the nerve mm -hmm. a little bit. But 90% but of your problem was this back pain and we could correlate it to this degenerated herniated disc. Mm -hmm. So patients like this, I target right into the bone area. Now I'm, I'm, I'm pretending you have modic changes <laughs> in the bone marrow here yep. and here. And why we do that is this disc isn't super alive, okay? All the discs, they're basically biological rubber. They have some cells, but mostly they're made of squishy proteins uh, that form the cartilage um, mm -hmm. and, make, and make it a cushion, make it a, 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 you know, a compressive element. But over time that disc is not getting what it needs and it gets what it needs from the cells in, in the bone above and below. And that includes nutrients and includes new proteins. It includes blood flow. Uh, cause there's not a lot of disc blood flow in the disc. It's mostly the health of the bone determines the health of the disc. Okay. Mm. And, um, when you were a fetus, and you were making that disc in the first place, your bones made it. The cells in what would become your bones made the disc. In fact, the stem cells made it. And you still retain some stem cells in your bone marrow, but if your bone marrow is degenerated too and having modic changes, you're not able to restore that disc. So we, we can help people do that. And, and just you know to make sure everyone's clear on this, um, I cannot make any claims because they have not yet been approved by the FDA, but this is what we do. And uh, this is uh, how we try to achieve the results based upon some really good science with uh, over 15 year follow up in France. So we're just behind here. Okay. Wow. Um, having said that, I would inject uh, exosomes to stimulate and reactivate cellular activity in your bone marrow and restore that bone marrow. We call that the subchondral bone because it's right next to the cartilage. Chondral is cartilage. And by stimulating both of these areas, um, we can jazz up the factory that made that disc in the first place to start making some factory parts, some proteins, um, and, and pump up that disc with some additional cartilage. Uh, and that should restore its function as a shock absorber. And uh, in doing so, it should, uh, the goal would be to reduce the pain that you have. It may or may not fix this problem, but if this is, again, just an incidental finding and you're suffering from back pain from the degeneration, this is what we do. Nice. Nice. Now, you know, I'm guessing that you see MRIs on folks where there's really not any major herniations, like in the case that I have or, or bulges and, and you just see disc degeneration just in and of itself. Yeah. And, and so those folks, I'm, I'm imagining like, that's a, a very important thing for folks that are like, I have pain. My doc told me there's just degenerative disc changes and there's nothing they can do. This is where stem cell and exosomes can come in and be incredibly helpful. Yeah. I mean, it's fair for decades. There, there really wasn't much to do besides you know, exercise and, and, you know, fixing the body the best you can. Uh, but use the use of regenerative medicine does have an application here. It's, it's, you know, this, this is cutting edge. This is uh, the latest. There are only a few people doing this in the country 
uh, most orthopedic doctors wouldn't even be able to access this area. So we do this very, very specifically. We do all the targeting ahead of time. We do it at a, at a um, surgery, like a surgery center for injections uh, with a little sedation because we are going into the bone and um, I don't want anyone to have to feel that because it does, you do feel it. <laughs> so we do some, it's not general anesthesia, it's just some sedation. And we use the uh, uh, image guidance to get to the target safely, avoid all the important things in that area. And uh, it's an injection from the back. I showed the areas, the arrows <laughs> from the front here, but they actually come in kind of through the flank um, to get to get to the targets. Less less stuff in the way, a little easier that way. Nothing dangerous in the way, just, <laughs> you know. Just some, you know, the muscle, the muscle's fine. You're, and you're sore for a little bit. We want people up and using them the next day. So no downtime. Nice. Nice. What, are, what is the most amount of discs that you've injected or not discs, vertebrae, bone tissue? Have you injected how many in, in one session? What's the most? Uh, I, I've done, I've done two in the same session combined with some, uh, lower back facet joints, which we didn't get into in your case because it wasn't relevant. But um, another common source of, of pain in the spine can be these, these joints, which can degenerate. And they are about three quarters to one inch off the midline on either side of the spine. So they, So the disc is not the only interaction between neighboring bones. There are these joints. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we we have people with demonstrated uh, joint pain, and you can have both disc and and um, the joints. So so there are people that come in, and and if one of those areas degenerates, the disc, for example, the facets take on a, a more stressful role, and they can degenerate at an accelerated rate, and vice versa. If your joints are degenerating, then your disc will be more stressed. So degeneration of one begets the degeneration of the other. So it's not uncommon in that crappy phrase, degenerative disc disease, to see also degenerative facet joints. So mm -hmm. we might do all of that in what I call a, a, you know, kind of a spinal makeover, right? We're, we're doing the disc and the joints. And there, there's, some good, there's some good research behind um, injecting the bone of the joints. So we, I would do the joints on both sides above and below the disc, as well as the bone above and below a disc. So you get uh, one, two, three, four, five, six injections for one segment. So um, I've done I've done someone where we've done two discs and three joint segments all at the same sitting. So that took me about an hour. Oh, wow. Wow. Huh. And this is, I mean, folks, this is not surgery. I mean, this is minimally invasive. I mean, it's just, it's injections. It's injections. Okay. It's it's injections. They are bone injections, but yes, they are injections. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's neat because nothing's getting, you know, we're not having a full on surgical procedure, which I think for a lot of people that sometimes is a d deterrent to getting care. And if we could get, you know, something that's, you get a sedative, you get, you know, injections, you're up and moving. My goodness. Right. I, I don't see why not. I, I kind of, am, I'm sad that I don't have... This is terrible. <laughs> my my disc is is too floppy um uh for hope, but but mm -hmm. I'm like in the future, in the future with my disc blown out there. Um if if say I decided that there was some degeneration on the disc above and below or the vertebrae above and below that disc where it's it's more or less blown out, would I then become a candidate to be able to have some regenerative injections? Yeah. Lord. I mean, you, okay. you would be, listen, the earlier you do this, the, the easier and better it can work because, uh, you know, it has, ha you have less regeneration you need to do and think about it for a minute. This is actually overarchingly interesting here. We're talking about degenerating discs, degenerative disc disease, even though we don't like that term, mm -hmm. the opposite of degeneration is regeneration. And that's what we're doing here. We're undegenerating through regeneration. 
<laughs> That's a lot of generation words. Recelebrate yeah. is why Dr. Gross calls this <laughs> his business um, things because it, you know it, it just makes sense. You can recelebrate life again. And and now that I know that I've got this kind of flap thing going on, um, of course, guys, Dr. Gross and I talked about cutting off my little flap and then seeing you know if that helped at all. Um, I'll have you kind of elaborate on that, and then we'll. Yeah, so this this is the piece out in the corner at the L five S one. Sorry, but it's it's actually this kind of the whole thing, you know, Napoleon's hat upside down piece. But this <laughs> this this would be removed through a very small surgery called a microdiscectomy. We would come through the back, make a little access through this bone called a laminotomy, because this is the lamina, um, and then I would basically just clean up this this piece. Now, at that time, if we were to do that, um, because I would be removing some of this disc, it, it is going to degenerate at an accelerated rate. While I'm there, I would probably recommend we stick some exosomes in the bone above and below. Mm -hmm. okay. But, um, you know, if you, if you can live without needing that surgery and you don't have a real foot drop, you have just a, a little bit of sensed weakness that you can work around. I, you know, this, this is elective. It's a judgment call. It's a quality of life decision. It's not a medical urgency. Yeah. Yeah. And so even if I didn't get it worked on and just left it there, I could, you know, even preventatively get some injections. Would you, would you have me do them? Um, I know we didn't talk about this before, but be devil's advocate for a minute. I'm looking at this going, okay, if it's going to degenerate, I want, I want to put stuff in it now. Um, is that a waste of time? Yeah. You don't have any need for it. I really okay. wouldn't do that. I mean, your, your bone marrow is perfect. Mm -hmm. So there's the, there would be no outcome. Okay. I mean, I, it's theoretical that, okay, we're, it's a prevention. Um, <clears throat> I'm not there yet. Um, yeah. I guess theoretically, yes, you could do this for preventative purposes. You have a family history of degeneration or you, you're someone who likes to do a lot of physical activity, but I, I don't think we're there yet. I think, and I hate to say it because, you know, we're trying to move, at least I am, and I know you are from sick care to prevention, but, um, I think this is a, a, a bit too much for prevention at the current, at its yeah. current state. Well, I appreciate your honesty. And I think a lot of people will, would too, in this case, and, and probably where I would look at is like, all right, so I monitor my pain. I work on my stabilizers. I work on all the, the lifestyle stuff. And, um, then from here we move to okay next you know in a year maybe two years i get a repeat and see where we're at and then we just monitor yeah, yeah unless something changes and you, all of a sudden you, you can't you know, you're limping significantly um or your pain goes up uh, i agree with you yeah yeah awesome well Good stuff here. Good stuff here. I think folks are going to get a lot out of this, especially your insider view to what yeah. is going on. Because I, in in any other situation, I've only had folks tell me like, yeah, my doc talked to me for two seconds and some people didn't even look at the MRI. So I, I think that's huge. I even look at MRIs of my patients, even though I am no specialist, but I still look to be like, is there anything I can correlate with what's on the report? So it's, yeah. it's good. It's good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I enjoy this. I've listened. I've looked at thousands of MRIs and interestingly, a spine surgeon like me <laughs> trying not to be a spine surgeon um, probably has a different view of what we see on the pictures than the radiologist. The radiologist, they don't know what the anatomy feels like, looks like, you know, we we've touched it we've, many times. Maybe the radiologist touched it in a cadaver in med school, but other than that, they just look at the pictures. We have the unique experience of looking at pictures and then touching the anatomy, looking at pictures, seeing the real anatomy. So we have a unique ongoing re-education and re-correlation of what that really means. So there are situations where a spine surgeon can read this better. Maybe not all situations, but there are situations better than a radiologist. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and that's why I love that you do consults for folks to take a look at, you know, you take a look at their imaging or you will order it guys. Um, he ordered my imaging for me so that I could get the, the good three, three T imaging because I, 
didn't have access to that where I was at. So something to something to think about there. Now, of course, you are located in Henderson, Nevada, which is very convenient for folks to pop in and pop out should they decide to come in for a show or whatnot in Vegas. So right. let's talk about Recelebrate. Let's talk about what's going on in the office and how folks can get in touch with you. Well, thank you. I, I didn't mean for this to be an, an advertisement, but I like I, I like to share all this years of experience with anyone. So if you have a spine problem or you, I'm doing a lot more than spines these days, but spines That's is where favorite. I came from. Um, I, I love second opinions. So we would get all your images and we can do most of this by telehealth, just like this, okay. look at your images together, just like this and um, see if we can help you figure something out. Even if you've had surgery or seen other doctors and just, you know, things aren't going the way you want. Um, but because I'm in a regenerative medicine space over the last five, now six years, um, we are doing lots of, of knees and ankles and shoulders and hips and all kinds of joints that are degenerating, trying to help people avoid or put off joint replacement surgery. Um, and we have some really cool results where we have demonstrated before and after MRIs showing regeneration of cartilage, like in the knee, for example. And we have some some videos coming out soon. We have some social media uh, examples where we've shown the two MRIs like nine months apart in the knee and some regrowth of cartilage. So it is possible. Uh, again, I can't make any claims that uh, a, a PRP stem cells or exosomes treat or cure anything, but I can show you what I think based on the literature and what I'd like to try with you short of surgery. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. I, I like what you're doing. And obviously we are going to continue chatting about things as you develop, um, get not develop. How do I, how do I want to say this as, as your, your practice grows in the regenerative medicine space, let's, let's go there. And, um, yeah, thank you so much for reviewing today. I really appreciate it. And, uh, gosh, we'll get this one out and, uh, we'll go from there. Thanks again. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm always here for phone a friend. If you have any interesting medical conundrum or you want to talk regenerative medicine, anti-aging, biohacking, or anything else fun. Love it. We, we certainly will get you back on for some of the, the biohacking stuff. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix Podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.